Sherlock Holmes and the Egyptian Mummy, The New Adventures, Episode 1, based on characters created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, spoken by Carl Mason. Holmes and my humble self were puzzled by a somewhat curious case that occurred in the summer of 1885. Due to self-explanatory circumstances, which soon will be revealed, it was not possible to publish this incident any earlier. Now that some time has passed, the legal implications, which are why the critical details had to be withheld from the public, have surely expired under the statute of limitations. We were still at the breakfast table when we heard a brief battle of words in the stairwell that ended with a protestation by our housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson. I glanced at Holmes. What could that be about? Without looking up from his pipe, which he was in the process of packing, Holmes replied, a bit of churlishness coupled with excessive fervour in direct confrontation with dutifulness. The tumultuous guest had meanwhile slipped past the good Mrs. Hudson and soon proceeded to knock vigorously on the front door. Holmes raised an eyebrow, a clear sign that he had only limited patience for such behaviour, but his curiosity prevailed. He gestured for me to answer the battered door. This was not how I had imagined my day to begin, but now there was nothing to be done about it. I went to the door and opened it. Good morning, sir. I stared. Am I correct to assume that you are experiencing a certain sense of urgency? The man at the door was a 50-year-old professorial type with glasses and a full beard. I was sure I had seen him before, but I couldn't remember the occasion. You must excuse me, he gasped, still winded from his charge up the stairs. I must speak to Mr. Holmes immediately. It's a matter of life or death. Actually, mainly death. I invited him in. Holmes had already gotten up from the table as the man approached. Thank goodness, Mr. Holmes, he cried excitedly. Holmes remained calm and nodded at the man. Good morning, director. Then he turned to me. Watson, do you know Mr. Edward Thompson, the director of the British Museum? I pretended that I recognized him and nodded at the gentleman. Certainly, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman wiped the sweat from this brow with a handkerchief and mumbled, Head librarian. Pardon me, I asked. Head librarian. Holmes quickly retorted. That's Mr. Thompson's official title. Precisely, the gentleman confirmed and sat down at the table without being offered a seat. You must excuse me, he repeated. Mrs. Hudson had meanwhile appeared at the door. Excuse me, sirs, but the gentleman could not be stopped. He insisted it was a matter of life and death. Holmes completed. Quite all right, Mrs. Hudson. We know each other. Mr. Hudson here is a learned historian. And today, history, he may be in a bit of a rush. Mrs. Hudson nodded skeptically, closed the door from the outside and started back to the ground floor. I decided to bring some order into the unannounced meeting. Can we offer you anything, Mr. Thompson? A cup of tea, perhaps? Thompson declined. Thank you. To be honest, I could use something stronger. Without saying a word, Holmes walked to the cabinet, took out my carafe of whiskey and a glass, put them down on the table in front of Thompson and poured him a glass. The whiskey was, and Holmes was well aware of this, procured by myself with great difficulties and expenses from the traditional distillery Mortlach in Dufton. Holmes, however, ignored my silent gestural protestation and sat down beside Thompson. Now, Director Thompson, you will certainly have an explanation for your hurried visit. Are you being followed? Thompson, startled and unsettled, looked over both shoulders. I, no, I don't think so. Then it must be a thought that is haunting you. Holmes continued, what is causing you such upheaval? Before giving his response, Thompson emptied the glass in one gulp and poured himself another. You must know, Mr. Holmes, that I am a level-headed man who isn't easily flustered. This morning, however, something most horrific occurred. 
Thompson paused and politely waited for Holmes to finally light his pipe. Perhaps you have heard, he went on, that we are presently preparing a colossal new exhibition at the British Museum, Treasures from Ancient Egypt. Among these treasures is a newly discovered Theban mummy in a lavish sarcophagus that just arrived from Alexandria a few days ago. I knew that Holmes had little interest in these things and preempted his negation by quickly interjecting, Certainly, we have read all about it. All of London is highly anticipating the opening. Thompson emptied his glass again. I am afraid London will have to wait as the main attraction has gone missing. Holmes remained outwardly unfazed. You mean the mummy? Quite right, Mr. Holmes. I am referring to the mummy. Thompson replied with a shaky voice. When I opened the sarcophagus an hour ago, it was empty. The mummy had vanished. Yesterday, everything was still in order. But now, I had to interrupt. You're not entertaining the notion that your mummy stood up and walked away, determined to tyrannize the Queen's good subjects in the heart of the Empire. My little joke just made Thompson more distraught. I... I don't think that, he stammered. You're not suggesting that. Dr. Watson isn't suggesting anything. Holmes interrupted. He plainly has a fable for preposterous humor and horrible dime novels. This case is no different than any other. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. The facts will reveal whether your mummy walked away was stolen or abducted. Thompson breathed a sigh of hope. You will agree to take on the case? Money is no object. If the mummy doesn't show up, the museum will be doomed. Anyhow, and I'll be doomed. Not to worry. Holmes reassured. We will seize your mummy and bring it back. Dead or alive, I added to my own amusement, which received no more than an anxious glance from Thompson and a punishing one from Holmes. The museum director promptly refilled his glass with my precious scotch and drank it down. First of all, Holmes explained, while I quietly picked up the carafe from the table and placed it back into the cabinet, it's important that you keep a clear head. In two hours, we will visit the museum and inspect the scene of the crime. While we are there, I ask you to please introduce us to everyone who had access to the collection. Thompson stood up. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. He said a long-winded goodbye before I was finally able to accompany him to the door. Holmes's grey eyes sparkled as the door clicked shut. The case seemed to have caught his imagination in a most enthusiastic way. Holmes, I tried to calm him. You mustn't be considering going on a mummy chase, my dear Watson. We are both scientists. You know as well as I that a corpse, no matter how well embalmed, cannot be brought back to life after 5,000 years. Not through magic spells, not by electricity or the likes. I dare say Lady Shelley and Webb Loudon would beg to disagree. I countered with a wink that, Remained unreciprocated. Fiction, good Watson. Holmes replied dryly, That's fiction. Science and fiction are fundamentally divergent things and in no way compatible. What do you suggest then? We will abide by the facts. Knowledge, observation and deduction are the cornerstones of my method, which by now you should be sufficiently familiar with. On now... Let's go to the British Museum. A half hour later, we were sitting in a coach on the way to Bloomsbury, where, not far from Russell Square, stood the museum, which was built in the classicist style. Holmes displayed a peculiar, joyful feeling of anticipation which I could not share. The mummy craze that had gripped England and parts of the continent decades ago, following Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, never interested me much. Aristocrats, in particular, enjoyed purchasing mummies and presenting them as attractions at the more frolicsome sort of parties. A highlight of these parties 
was the act of unwrapping the broad strips of linen covering the long deceased bodies. To me, this neither represented a very reverent handling of individuals who were preserved for eternal peace, nor did it adhere to a minimum of hygiene to which, as a doctor of medicine, I felt obliged. After a few minutes of silence, Holmes said to me as if he had read my thoughts, Watson, you are certainly aware of the fact that the majority of mummies throughout Europe are fakes. The strips of linen often conceal the mortal remains of recently deceased criminals or even animals, well dried and oiled, of course. Preparations such as these can be performed within a short period of time. In some cases, there is nothing but rotten wood and sawdust underneath the linen. This was not necessarily a reassuring thought. What a world in which even human bodies can become commodities. And how depraved must one be to present to a gullible public the dead body parts of delinquents or smoked house cats as archaeological artifacts? You don't think, I replied, that the mummy that has disappeared is also a fake? Holmes shook his head. I don't believe anything. I am simply organizing my thoughts. I'll certainly let your knowledgeable hands and eyes handle any potential dissection of the corpse in order to determine its age. I had to protest. Thank you for your trust and appreciation, but I am a medical doctor, Holmes, not a coroner. Holmes raised his right pointer finger. Then you should become one, Watson. Forensic pathology as an important part of scientific criminology. I still prefer living patients, I insisted. The benevolent look on Holmes's face did not spell anything good. Fine, he began with a calm voice. Should our embalmed corpse, against all expectations, turn out to be alive, you will certainly find another field of work. Mr. Thompson will certainly assist you during the anamnesis as an Egyptian interpreter. Besides frowning, I could only spit out one word. Anamnesis? Holmes nodded. Naturally, Watson. As a physician, you will certainly have to admit that it cannot be healthy for a corpse to restart breathing after thousands of years, even without any inner organs. Therefore, examinations and possible treatments seem to me not only appropriate but indispensable. Holmes's face lit up with an almost mischievous grin. He was pulling my leg. Well, I answered, too bad that I haven't got my doctor's bag on me. Finally, the coach came to a stop in front of the main entrance of the museum on Great Russell Street. The impressive columned portal, a splendid symbol of the empire's cultural historical appropriation of the world, seemed to me today more menacing than welcoming in its grandeur, while Holmes skipped up the stairs energetically, I plodded along behind him resignedly. Mr. Thompson had already expected us in the foyer. He led us past groups of visitors to the permanent exhibitions, to a closed-off area where the new exhibition of ancient Egyptian artifacts will take place. We walked past hieroglyphics on stele, statues of animals and chimeras, copper scarabs, papyrus fragments, as well as the famous Rosetta Stone, which, as an expert of paleography, was especially dear to Thompson and arrived at the sarcophagus in question. Laid out in the middle of a dedicated space, it was a glistening showpiece in gold, sapphire blue and ruby red, decorated with reliefs and hieroglyphics. Polished and lit, it reflected all the splendor of the ancient pharaonic kingdom on the Nile, and yet it was nothing more than a coffin. The vehemence with which the Egyptians wanted to cheat impermanence in order to delay the natural course of all things living ultimately demonstrates how little trust they had in their own concept of the hereafter. From a scientific perspective, it is utterly remarkable with what degree of professionality dead bodies were conserved. Given the limited knowledge of chemistry and anatomy that existed at the time, yet Thompson could not present to us the result of this undertaking. We could see for ourselves that the sarcophagus was indeed empty.
Although there was nothing to see, Holmes inspected the open sarcophagus for several minutes. While Thompson and I stood beside him, he ran his hand across the top and the inside, scratched at the latter, knocked and shook the lid, measured it, and even inhaled its odour. Just as I wanted to put an impatient end to the spectacle, Holmes suddenly straightened himself, turned to us and declared, Aha, just as I had suspected. He walked around the sarcophagus once more, stopped directly in front of us, and turned to the museum director. Your sarcophagus, Mr. Thompson, appears to be just the innermost shell of the mummy's entombment. Am I correct to assume that it was enclosed in a second, mostly wooden sarcophagus? And that one, in turn, rested inside a stone sarcophagus on site in Thebes? Respect, Thompson replied. That is correct. The limestone cuboid remained at the gravesite. The in-between shell is in Cairo. We were only interested in the golden inner sarcophagus and naturally its content. Holmes nodded knowingly, and your golden sarcophagus. I assume it weighs around 240 pounds. Its weight distributed equally between the lid and the bottom half. The director agreed again. That's right. These figures correspond to our studies. Holmes slowly walked around the sarcophagus once more, but this time in the opposite direction. When he made a full circle, he announced, Well now, I've got what I need, Mr. Thompson. I would now like to talk to all employees who had access to the sarcophagus. Very well, Mr. Holmes. I will fetch them both immediately. They are in the basement. One moment, please. Thompson rushed off and left us alone. I rose to speak. Mr. Holmes, what have you discovered? Several things, dear Watson, he confirmed. But first things first, I didn't find any scratch marks on the interior of the lid, nor any other indication of a forceful opening of the sarcophagus from the inside. Therefore, we can in good conscience rule out the possibility that the mummy broke out all by itself. Hear, hear, I cried. What a relief. Nevertheless, Holmes cautioned me immediately that does not preclude any potential help from the outside. Holmes, spare me your jests. What about knowledge, observation and deduction? Have patience, dear friend. Holmes tried to comfort me all in due time. We will first want to question the director's employees. Premature conclusions are subject to poor precision and errant haste. Before I could press on any further, the director reappeared. He was accompanied by a young lady and a young man who looked like a student. Mr. Thompson introduced them. These are my closest associates on the special Egypt exhibition. My personal assistant, Miss Jane Norton. Very pleased to make your acquaintance, Mr. Holmes interjected. And Mr. Bellingham, a committed student of Egyptology, Thompson continued. Holmes gave him a brief nod. Now. Let's begin, he said. After all, you have already lost enough time to this anguish and certainly still have much work to do in preparation for the exhibition, so we don't want to keep you away from your tasks for too long. Strain was written on their faces. Thompson apparently had high expectations for his employees. Bellingham, hardly over 20 years old, looked exhausted. His hair was in a mess and appeared to be graying from the dust in the basement. Miss Norton, who was about the same age as her colleague, looked equally tired. The right sleeve of her white smock was stained with brown dust. Holmes, who noticed the stain, immediately assumed the role of courteous gentleman and pulled out his handkerchief. Oh, may I? He said with a smile, took her hand and dusted off her sleeve. For poor Miss Norton, however, this gesture was a bit too forthcoming. Her face was noticeably blushed as Holmes returned his handkerchief to his pocket. 
For me, on the other hand, this was certainly not the first time I had observed Holmes attempt to unnerve his subject during questioning. I assumed that this was what he was presently engaged in. Miss Norton, Holmes finally began. How long have you been working for Mr. Thompson? The interviewee had collected herself again and responded quickly for two and a half years. And how did you become associated with this exhibition? The director interjected. You must know Mr. Holmes. Miss Norton's father and I were fellow students at the University of Oxford. Mr. Norton grew severely ill a few years ago and Mrs. Norton regrettably passed away over 15 years ago. I therefore saw it my duty to... I understand. Holmes interrupted. Miss Norton, when did you last see the mummy? Last night, she answered. Mr. Thompson and I closed the sarcophagus before we locked up the hall and left the museum. And at that point, the mummy was still in its place. Thompson nodded vehemently. Naturally. Naturally. Holmes repeated, let's discuss this morning. Where were you, Miss Norton, when it was discovered that the mummy was missing? In the basement storage, she explained. I was in the process of bringing up the copper scorpions to place next to the scarabs. I heard Mr. Thompson scream and immediately ran upstairs. That's correct, confirmed the director, although it took some time before she arrived since the basement is quite maze-like. I would get hopelessly lost down there, but luckily, Miss Norton is the only one who finds her way around those narrow rooms and corridors. Up until this point, Bellingham had stood next to Miss Norton, unaffected and relatively motionless. Now, Holmes turned his attention to him. And you, where and how did you spend the last 20 hours? The student did not show any signs of nervousness. Yesterday, I left the museum earlier than usual in order to study the Book of the Dead at home until late at night. Holmes furrowed his brow. The Book of the Dead, a collection of ancient Egyptian magic spells and incantations, Bellingham explained, and suddenly began reciting, O oh, Armon, who art in heaven, turn thy face upon the dead body of the child and make your child sound and strong in the netherworld. Thank you, thank you, Holmes interrupted. Very impressive. You know, Bellingham continued, Egyptian mythology is my speciality. That's why I applied to this museum when I learned of this new exhibition. Mr. Bellingham is a temporary hire. He just started recently, confirmed Thompson. His expertise and particularly his enthusiasm are impressive. Indeed, muttered Holmes more to himself than to the others. And today, Mr. Bellingham. When did you arrive here today? Just two hours ago, he answered. Miss Norton subsequently informed me of the mummy's disappearance. At that point, Mr. Thompson was likely still with you, Mr. Holmes. Holmes nodded. He embarked to pace around the sarcophagus once more, but stopped halfway and turned around. Miss Norton, Mr. Bellingham, that would be all for now. I thank you for your time and cooperation. You can now get back to work. Should I have any further questions? Mr. Thompson was so good as to note down your addresses for me. Thompson nodded at them both in affirmation, upon which his assistants quickly returned to the basement. Mr. Director, sir, I have one more question for you, Holmes said. As soon as we three were alone again, is it true that there are three people who, independently from one another, have access to this hall with their keys? Thompson answered without much thought. Well, that is of course true for Miss Norton and Mr. Bellingham. They are the only ones who have keys to this hall. They're not exactly the only ones, Holmes corrected. Don't you also have all the keys? Thompson began to stutter slightly. Naturally, but Mr. Holmes, what are you inferring? You, you don't believe that I myself, I don't believe anything, Mr. Thompson. Holmes quickly objected. I put the facts together. It is a fact that this hall is only accessible through one single door. It is a fact that this door was not opened forcefully last night. The lock remains undamaged. 
and it is a fact that only three people have the keys to this door. Thompson wiped the sweat off his brow with a handkerchief. That is all correct, Mr. Holmes, but that doesn't make any sense. Not yet, Holmes corrected. If you allow Dr. Watson and I must now bid adieu. I have some more investigating to do, upon which we will surely convict the culprit or culprits. Good day, Mr. Thompson. Holmes left the hall with vigorous steps. I followed him with a slight delay. The museum director stayed behind, a bit perplexed, looking at his empty sarcophagus. In front of the museum, Holmes was finally ready to talk about the state of things, yet he quickly turned the tables. So, Watson, he asked, what did you notice in there? You treated the employees with velvet gloves, I answered quickly, but then turned up the pressure on the director. You furthermore brought his assistant's loyalty to him into question. What do you expect from this? A sense of insecurity, Holmes explained. The three of them will now certainly talk about it and possibly suspect one another. If one of the culprits is indeed among them, then he or she should know that we are closing in. Is one of the three the perpetrator? Holmes shook his head. Not necessarily, but possibly. There could naturally be more keys that Thompson doesn't know about. And for a professional burglar who knows his trade, it is not a difficult task to open a locked door without leaving a trace. This explanation left me a bit puzzled. I searched his face. Do you mean to tell me that we know nothing? I cried with some frustration. Holmes smiled amusedly. Far from it, dear friend. He retorted, We know, for example, that the thief has a specialized interest. Who else would steal a mummy of no significant monetary value but leave behind the actual valuable golden sarcophagus, not to mention the other jewels in the exhibition? This means the motivation here is not merely personal enrichment. That was some good insight indeed. I was upset at myself for not considering this on my own. Besides, Holmes continued, there were certainly at least two culprits. One person, let alone a young lady, would hardly be able to open such a heavy sarcophagus. I thought for a second and then dared to share a theory that I immediately regretted Miss Norton and Mr. Bellingham could have committed the crime together without any trouble. Slow down, slow down, my dear Watson, Holmes cautioned me promptly. Opportunity and probability alone do not constitute the basis for a suspected crime. What's more, the two seem to me more competitive than cooperative. That said, they appear to have been working all night, for which they have no witnesses other than the basement walls. Before I could say anything, Holmes flagged down a carriage and as he was stepping in, he turned to me and said, our paths part here for now, Watson. I still have some important procurements to make on the way. We'll meet later on Baker Street. And what should I do? I asked with a subtle note of protestation. When you're able, please speak to the museum guard. Holmes begged the British Museum with all its treasures is certainly not left unguarded all night. Find out about the safety protocol in place during closing hours. I felt quite honoured that Holmes entrusted me with such an important task. All right, I answered dutifully. It later occurred to me that this was more occupational therapy than a necessary investigation. When I arrived at Baker Street around two hours later, Indeed, equipped with relatively few new insights, I found Holmes working in his small laboratory performing chemical analysis. He seemed entirely preoccupied and hardly took notice of my arrival. I observed him silently for five minutes before he looked up. Come here, Watson, he ordered. I approached, despite of his rather rude tone. He held a small dish with brown powder in it, up to my nose. Smell, Watson. I took a deep sniff. It was a flattering scent with an oriental note. 
somewhere between Levantine, Anatolian spices and the sweet smoke of Maghreb shishas. And, Holmes inquired, pleasant, I answered, sweet and spicy at once. Interesting. Holmes held out a small teaspoon. Try it. I hesitated and looked at Holmes, skeptically. Holmes, this isn't a psychotropic substance, such as cocaine or the likes. You know that as a physician, I reject these things. No, no, he assured. Certainly not. Trust me. I took the spoon, shoveled a small amount of the powder onto its tip, and looked at Holmes with a stern expression. No drugs. Holmes shook his head with a smile, and I put the spoon in my mouth. The flavour corresponded to its scent. The aftertaste was a bit salty and smoky. All in all, a pleasant spice mixture. Well now, I said after swallowing down the spoonful, exquisite. This mixture would be perfectly suited for an eastern Mediterranean barbecue. What is it? Mummia, Holmes replied. I gasped. I was able to let out, excuse me, between fits of coughing and gagging. Holmes clapped my back paternalistically. Pulvis mummie, mummy powder, he repeated. It's made by finely grounding down a mummy. Mummy has been regarded as a medicine for centuries, millennia even. I gagged twice more, spit into my handkerchief and then loosened my collar to supply my red face with more oxygen. Damn it, Holmes, I gasped. I know very well what mummy is. You let me eat a ground mummy? Have you lost your mind? Calm down, Holmes replied. Most available mummy is not made from genuine Egyptian mummies, but from fakes. How comforting, I cried, still upset. Then all I was party to was standard cannibalism. Where did you even get this stuff? No reputable pharmacy would dare to sell this nonsense these days. A colleague of yours was so good to give me some, Holmes explained. A colleague? A wretched quack is what he is? I said, outraged. I want to know his name, Holmes. I will report the fellow. They should revoke his medical license. Calm down, won't you? Holmes said, you're being childish. The doctor reckoned. Doctor who? I insisted. Would you be so good as to tell me his name? Holmes sighed. If it relieves you, Watson, I was given this sample by a certain Dr. Jekyll. His practice is on Cavendish Square. I jotted down his name and address in my notebook and told myself I would give my colleague a piece of my mind when I got the chance, but it would never come to that. When I wanted to look him up some time later, he had mysteriously died. But that is another story. I slowly regained my footing. Well now, Holmes, what did you want to achieve with this exercise? I poured myself a glass of whiskey in order to flush my mouth. Holmes pulled out his handkerchief, unfolded it and shook it over a plate. Tiny brown particles, similar in appearance to the mummy powder, fell onto the plate. Remember, he explained, when I wiped Miss Norton's sleeve at the museum, we will now compare the substance I retrieved to the mummy I purchased. I see, I answered. If the substance in question turns out to be mummy then Miss Norton had a hand in... Not only the disappearance of the mummy, but also in its subsequent treatment. Holmes nodded. That's right. He shoveled a bit of powder from the dish with a teaspoon and held it in front of my face. Watson, now, would you be so kind as to try the reference sample? I gasped for breath and held up my hands in protest. Holmes, you can't be serious. I will absolutely not taste another mummy. No, thank you. It had occurred to me that you might boycott my experiments. Holmes said soberly. He emptied the powder into a small test tube and began heating it up above a gas flame. The methods of chemical analysis are, anyhow, much more precise than your irritable taste buds. Smoke rose from the tube and Holmes inhaled it intently. He then added a clear liquid that initially accelerated the development of smoke, 
before turning the content of the tube purple. Holmes turned to me triumphantly. Quod era demonstrandum. And what exactly did you prove? I asked. It's mummier, Holmes declared. Verifiably tar, balsamic resin and potash. The share of dried human tissue is of course more difficult to determine. I was somewhat astonished. You can determine all this from your little experiment? Holmes smiled impishly. No, it's not that simple. I had already performed some other analysis before you arrived. That would mean that my mummy tasting was entirely superfluous, but I would not let myself get upset again. Good, I said calmly. And how shall we apply your newfound knowledge? It appears, Holmes explained, that Miss Norton manufactured mummia in the basement of the museum. The mummy thus left the gallery as a powder. This means that the mummy has likely been destroyed, which Mr. Thompson will not like to hear. We know that Miss Norton sought genuine mummia from the remains of a real pharaonic tomb. Nevertheless, there are still two unknowns. Firstly, who helped Miss Norton? And secondly, why did she do it? I'm sure you already have a plan for finding the answers to your remaining questions, I presumed. Naturally. My good Watson, Holmes confirmed, we will simply ask Miss Norton straight away. Around an hour later, it was dark by now, we went to the address Miss Norton gave us and stood before her apartment door. We were a trifle surprised that she lived on Brick Lane in the East End. It seemed that her family must have experienced some sort of social decline. Miss Norton opened the door immediately, as if she was expecting us. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, she greeted us. I presume you would like to enter. Please come in. She led us into a sparsely decorated room that had a single adjourning room. She sat down at a simple wooden table and offered us seats while I sat down thanking her. Holmes declined the offer and got straight to the point. Thank you, Miss Norton. I prefer to stand. I believe you know why we are here. She nodded slowly. My father told me it wouldn't take long before you showed up. He said you were England's finest detective after all. What? Only England's? I asked with an ironic undertone. Holmes ignored the comment. Am I correct to presume? He continued his questioning. That your father was your accomplice that night at the museum? That he helped you to lift the cover of the sarcophagus and steal the mummy? Miss Norton seemed almost apathetic, yet affirmed the question with a nod. Holmes turned up the volume in the catacombs of the basement, which no one knows better than you. You set up everything necessary for grinding down the mummy. There you and your father likely set up a small mechanical powder mill without anyone noticing. I must admit rather brilliant yet simple. Who would suspect such a thing from a theft? Miss Norton knew she had been caught. The evidence would be found at the latest in the course of an inspection of the British Museum's basement. She stood up, walked to the door of the adjacent room and was about to open it. I'd like to show you something, she said. Holmes and I followed her through the door and found ourselves in a darkened room. The only light came from a flickering candle on a dresser. In one of the dark corners of the room there was a hairy human form whose silhouette was difficult to make out. As Holmes and I walked to the centre of the room, the form slowly approached with heavy and unsteady steps. The candlelight first only illuminated one arm, bandaged with narrow strips of linen up to the fingertips. Next, we could recognize a head. This too was bandaged almost entirely, with the exception of the eyes and mouth. My heart beat in my throat. It was clear before us stood the mummy. It took another step towards us and said, Good evening, gentlemen. Holmes remained calm. Mr. Norton, I presume. The mummy figure nodded. Please excuse my appearance, but my illness does not allow for the proper evening dress. In full candlelight, they could now see that Norton was wearing a kind of nightgown. Almost his entire body was bandaged, and he found it 
difficult to speak. I am suffering from a largely unknown illness that is slowly eating up my skin and outer body tissue. The doctors are clueless and have already given up. All the unsuccessful treatments have exhausted my entire fortune. Naturally, I haven't been able to be seen in public during the daytime for years. That is certainly a difficult and unfortunate circumstance. Holmes replied, for you and your daughter. Nevertheless, you will understand that I am also interested in the whereabouts of the Egyptian mummy. Naturally, Mr. Holmes, Norton replied. Unfortunately, the mummy has been almost entirely destroyed. That is to say, pulverized. After thousands of years, the corpse of a mummy, despite of its treatment, has shrunken greatly and only offers little substance. He pointed at several jars on the dresser that evidently contained mummy. The mummy powder is my last hope for healing. Perhaps it could, when applied on the outside and inside, stop the decaying of my living flesh or at least slow it down. Mr. Norton, I interjected, as sorry as I am, but science has proven that there is no serious medical application for mummy not even for the regeneration of tissue. Modern pharmacology has rightly removed it from its array of treatments. It's nothing more than superstition. Norton shook his bandaged head. Dr. Watson, if one is in my desperate circumstance, then one is susceptible to believe many things. An archaeologist friend of mine, who works in Cairo, informed me of the delivery of the new mummy to the British Museum. What's more, he was under the impression that, although it had not yet been determined with certainty, the mummy was a find from a real king's tomb, and that it was a pharaoh from the time of Ramses, who, if not a descendant of the sun god himself, could be more promising. But that hope has been lost now too. Then Norton turned to Holmes. Mr. Holmes, I am ready to accept the consequences and accompany you to the police station. My life is over, anyhow. However, I beg you most fervently to put in a good word for my daughter. Three weeks later, the grand opening of the new and expanded ancient Egyptian collection took place at the British Museum. According to plan, it was a huge success. All of London was talking about it, especially beguiling was the new sarcophagus, which was displayed open and seen by the public for the first time, and inside of it, Wrapped in thick bandages was the mummy. Holmes and I were also invited to the festivities. The elated director, Thompson, thanked us profusely and repeatedly for having saved his exhibition and returning the lost mummy. Within 72 hours, we had found it, packed it into a simple wooden crate and returned it to the museum. To the police, we reported that although we secured the stolen property, the thieves likely a band of professional criminals from Germany, regrettably got away and were probably back on the continent by now. There would be little chance of catching them. We left the opening party early. Holmes smiled contently as we were descending the steps in front of the museum. I, on the other hand, still had my doubts about the outcome of our case. I appreciate your self-satisfaction, I began, but isn't it so that we had a hand in the triumph of injustice. You lied to the police after all. Holmes seemed almost amused by my pangs of conscience. My dear Watson, to do the right thing does not always coincide with justice. Or would you like to discuss the fine line between legality and righteousness with the judge? After some brief consideration, I had to disagree. I am a physician, Holmes, not a lawyer, and least of all a moral philosopher but you must answer me two things. Holmes stopped in his tracks. Go on, he encouraged me. Well, for one, I would like to know where Mr. Norton and his daughter are. I gather that Thompson granted his assistant a long, paid vacation. You don't happen to have anything to do with this, Holmes? Not directly, he answered. Mr. Norton is currently at a dermatological sanatorium near Vienna. On my recommendation, as I was told yesterday, there seem to be some early successes with his treatment, and his daughter is accompanying him. Naturally, 
This explanation was not entirely satisfying. But Holmes, I continued, Mr. Norton was almost entirely without means. How can he pay for the stay and the treatment? Oh, that is not a problem, Holmes said. When I told Thompson about his old colleague's unfortunate state of health, he was immediately willing to cover the costs. Even I found this amusing, and my face broke out in a brief smile. One thing, however, remained unanswered. That's all well and good, Holmes, I said, having regained my composure. Now there's only one more thing. Yes, Holmes answered. I looked him sternly in the eyes. Who or what in God's name is lying in that sarcophagus? My dear Watson, Holmes replied. You certainly know the Victoria Lodge gatehouse at the north end of Hyde Park. I nodded. Well, the gatekeeper there, Mr. Winbridge, set up a small, naturally unofficial, cemetery hidden in the backyard. Good heavens, I interjected. You didn't exhume a corpse, did you? Holmes looked innocently. Why not? He asked, unstirred. Since we were still on the square in front of the museum, I whispered, concerning this, the legal and ethical circumstances are unambiguously clear. You can't just steal a human corpse and exhibit it in a museum. Holmes raised an eyebrow. No, is what Egyptologists and mummy researchers do substantially different? But no need to get upset, Watson. I didn't do anything of the sort. The small necropolis in Hyde Park is a pet cemetery. It is the burial ground for mostly cats and dogs. And a monkey. This one, a small chimpanzee, was kindly given to me by Mr. Winbridge for a small fee. With Miss Norton's expert help, I prepared the animal carcass. I am happy to give you the details at a later time, so that it more or less resembles our lost mummy. At least, as long as nobody removes the bandages, the deception will remain undiscovered. In light of this admission, I was literally at a loss for words. Without any further comment, I followed Holmes to the street where a coach was already waiting for us. Behind us, inside of the museum, Mr. Thompson, admired by the visitors, celebrated by the press, was still proudly presenting the marvellous golden pharaoh sarcophagus in which an ordinary chimpanzee was laid to rest so he could stand before Osiris's hall of judgment.